Quoi que ce qu'il y a, uh, welcome uh, everybody. My name is Alexandre Nicuado. I'm here with my colleague André Zdomen. And uh, this week, uh, our guest is Kawinati. If you can uh, introduce yourself, Kawinati. Certainly. Sego sewo guego, Kawinati ni waksanoda. I am from originally from Gahnawage near Montreal. I am a Ganyange Haga or Mohawk, and I'm a contemporary artist. Uh, welcome, Skawinati, on uh, Adadagan Street. Uh, yeah, you must uh, feel, feel at all. This is <laughs> <laughs> a Mohawk name, uh, a brand new Mohawk name for an uh, old Mohawk territory. And uh, so we are very proud to uh, have contributed, actually, to the, 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 the topo uh, toponymic change uh, Uh, of the street and uh, to have uh, chosen uh, this uh, uh, emblematic uh, name uh, for our uh, podcast. And uh, wow, you, you fit exactly in the, you are the good person in the good place. <laughs> <laughs> Especially that uh, we are uh, webcasting the, the, this uh, podcast. So welcome. Uh, well, I see you when I am really uh, going back uh, in uh, uh, the 90s where the, the, what we can call the actual contemporary arts movement, uh, indigenous uh, contemporary art movement started. Uh, and uh, I remember with Arthur Lamott, we went to uh, Ottawa to film Indigena, the... Uh, an uh, art exhibition at the National Gallery with Gerald McMaster that was there. It was the, the, really the, the beginning, beginning. And uh, for many, many people, it was astonishing. What? Indigenous contemporary art. Nobody uh, in the mind of uh, many people, and not only public, but in the mind of the critics of the... Uh, of the art milieu, it was impossible to connect for many people, indigenous and modern art. And uh, uh, I want to start there because many young people, like Alexandre, <laughs> uh, may think that what we see now, indigenous artists and in museums and galleries that they were, that It, it was the, the, the uh, it is uh, uh, the normality uh, that has been there for long. No, it's brand new. And so, can you speak of uh, uh, you at uh, this, at this fantastic, but at the same time difficult period, the 90s? Yeah, thanks. Oh, it's so yeah. nice to talk about that, actually. We mm -hmm. haven't, I haven't talked about that very often. Over the, over the years. Um, at that moment, so Indigena, trying to think of what I was doing. I think in 1992, I was doing a graduate degree, a graduate diploma here at Concordia University. Um, I had done my fine arts degree, my bachelor's degree already, and got out of university and got really afraid because I didn't know what to do. <laughs> I didn't know what kind of work I could, what kind of job I could get. Um, so I went back to school. Um, and after, so I'm trying to tell you, you know, I, oh yeah, of course. I graduated from Concordia from my fine arts degree, I think, or one of those degrees or diploma. And I, um, I was, At, when I was at Concordia, I had joined the student group called AFNC, Assembly of First Nations Concordia, <laughs> which is funny. I'm laughing, and I think you know it's because, of course, there was the Assembly of First Nations, the national organization. But we weren't like we weren't like a spinoff or anything. We just didn't think of a better name, I guess. <laughs> and um, there was some there was artists in that group. There was Ryan Rice. Eric Robertson, Arthur Renwick, 
Varan Pardeatan, and Mary Longman. And I hope I'm not forgetting anyone, but those those folks were in my cohort. So we were we were meeting together regularly. We all took a trip up north uh, to Robert Otterize's territory. And so we were quite a nice, cohesive group of we became friends. Um, and so when we graduated, Ryan, Eric, and I decided to start an artist collective called Nation to Nation. We wanted to make sure, so, and we, so I said this already, we were contemporary artists, right? And we just, we joined it, we, we joined together because we wanted to keep producing work and exhibiting work. And we very clearly did not think we would be exhibited in any galleries around. We didn't think we'd be exhibited in either the artist run centers nor the, the museums or, or, you know, bigger galleries. And so, uh, you know, but we saw things happening. Like, so in 1990, of course, was the siege of Gunasadage or the Oka crisis, as it's both, they're known by both things now. You know, we saw Indigena happening. We saw the Spirit Sings happening. And uh, we saw Nouveau Territoire here in Montreal. I believe those two were 19, I think 1992 was both Indigena and um, Nouveau Territoire. I think Nouveau Territoire was uh, maybe a few years before anyway. It's yeah? Not, yeah? Okay. No, a while. I, I am not sure too. <laughs> anyway, it's, uh, yeah. it, it was in those times. Anyway. Yes, it was early 90s, all of that. Uh, so, yeah, and I think it, I think it was, we just, we just kept making that work, not knowing, how can I say, I'll talk for myself, you know, I wasn't thinking about breaking into galleries. I was thinking about making work and supporting the community, like being supported by the community, but also like creating these moments, like our nation to nation events were so amazing. <laughs> if I do say so myself, the first one we had was called a celebration of art. And um, Eric Robertson was at that time seeing Michelle Thrush, who has since become a famous actress. Um, and at this time she had written, uh, she had written a performance, a one woman performance that she wanted to show. And we had some art. So we and now Eric had this beautiful loft in old Montreal where it was actually still cheap for art. You know, artists could live there cheaply. Uh, and so we, we made up, we drew a little invitation and we photocopied it and we handed it out to some people and over a hundred people showed up that night to look at our work and to see uh, Michelle's performance. And then we, then we offered people, we, we, impromptu had an open mic and we couldn't believe the people who got up we didn't even know them and they get, they said poetry and they you know arthur sang and played his guitar and it was just this incredible evening we had food and we just knew we were doing something right and we had a, almost a, a similar thing happened when we did our show called native love where we invited, you know, and felt like we invited a few people. We didn't know who would come. And, and many, many people showed up in this super obscure location where we, we were lent uh, somebody's office space in the Nord, Nord, uh, Nordelec building. And now it's condos, but it was like a gigantic building of offices, you know, at that time. So, yeah, we just, uh, I, or like I said, you know, that's what I mean by sort of supporting each other. Like that was the times when if there was a native art event, I was there. Like, you know, I just showed up to everything, but there wasn't that many things. In contrast to now, you know, where there's some, there's so much happening all the time. I'm like, I actually can't attend everything anymore, you know, and it's wonderful. It's, it's really great that that's happening. But yeah, I remember I, also of uh, Art Bingo. Yes! Organized. I was there. <laughs> yes! <laughs> and uh, 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 Bordelot, the, uh, uh, the, 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 he was there, the Cree uh, guy, and he was so excited. I was like, ah! ah! 
<laughs> and he won the big uh, the big prize. I was so angry. I wanted to, to win. <laughs> yeah, you play bingo, you win art. We said, yeah, that was really that was another one. That was supposed that was our first fundraiser, but we we didn't raise that much money. <laughs> we rented the bingo machine. We bought got T-shirts made. Yeah, that was that was uh, too bad for us, but it was a fun event, and you still remember it. And a lot of people walked away with a lot of original art that night. And uh, also, uh, already, I think, uh, uh, in uh, uh, your own uh, parkour, uh, your, uh, your own way, you were already uh, uh, in uh, uh, this uh, non uh, world. Uh, uh, putting down boundaries uh, between arts and life and uh, uh, between uh, artists and uh, uh, normal <laughs> or uh, uh, alpha human being and uh, that lambda human beings. So it's interesting because uh, uh, very rapidly, and uh, you were certainly at the vanguard. You went to uh, uh, have activities on cyberspace, on the web, and it was just the beginning of the web in the 90s. So how come you uh, make this, uh, well, now it seems natural, but at this time it was a big jump in the unknown, uh, brand new web world. And uh, I am wondering how come uh, you uh, uh, make this uh, huge step? Well, you know, I, I, I don't, it's a little bit mysterious to me too, in a way. Uh, when I was at Concordia, there was a, um, a course called computer as a design tool so yes that's so that's exactly what we're talking about like now everyone thinks that designers use computers to design but but and you know my first year going in we were still using rapidograph pens french curves you know we mechanical pencils there was no computers except that suddenly or yeah, i don't know about suddenly but i mean eventually or soon the design art department got these cute little boxes, Apple IIe's, right? And and we had a class. Uh, computer as a design tool was a class, and it showed us HyperCard, which is the precursor to the web. It's it was about linking files together, click and being able to click on a link and go to another file. So that happened. And there was, and then they also got these other computers called Amigas. And these Amiga computers were really about, this was before Photoshop. So there was a program called DigiPaint and you could like, you could take a picture of someone. Uh, how did it work? Anyway, basically you could do Photoshop before Photoshop, very rudimentary version of it. And I, I mean, I was just fascinated by this. I, I loved it. I felt like, I felt like I could do things that I wasn't able to do before. Like my drawing is was okay, but I wanted something very realistic, and this was able to offer that to me. You know, I remember I did a I did a series of pictures called "Lovers Tongue Tied and Tied to the Tongue." It's a lyric from a song by the Jesus and Mary Chain. But what I did is I took pictures of my friends sticking their tongues out at each other in different ways. And then I use the tools to attach the tongues and make, make the tongue into a big bow or into a knot. So they were tied together, you know? So that's what I mean when I say like, I could get this realistic image uh, and it was different than drawing it. So the big thing that happened, which is a story that I do tell a lot is after I graduated, I was attending. So in addition to Nation to Nation, I was also Oh, yeah. I started to, anyway, I started to get into the artist-run centers. I got an internship at Obero Gallery and Studio XX, which has now got a different name, which I think is Ada, but I'm sorry if I miss saying that, but Studio XX existed and they were a place to teach. They were a production place for women 
uh, to learn about technology. So they would have these evenings called Wired Women or Femme Branche, where they would demonstrate new, new technologies. And one night they demonstrated the palace. And the palace was something so cutting edge. It was a chat room, which wasn't brand new. That was like, I mean, it was relatively new, but you know, not a lot of people knew what they were, but they were text-based little windows that you would open and you would be able to talk to people real time, you know, immediately anywhere in the world by texting. Well, what the palace did is they took that technology and they they let people they they made it visual. They made it image based. And so the rooms now look like little rooms with like a ch maybe a, some chairs in there or different kinds of rooms and you were represented by this thing called an avatar. And here you were this little happy face that could move around by pushing the arrow keys. And when you typed Oh, your words came out in a little balloon like a cartoon. And I fell in love. I don't I don't know what it was about it, but I just I wanted to be there. I wanted to be in this palace place. I was in there every day talking to other people about anything. You know, it wasn't just it wasn't about native art or art. It was just about life, you know, making all kinds of friends, but always new friends like I can't I think there were a few people that I would see regularly but it was like it was just like a party all the time that's how it felt to me. It was it in 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 2D? Yes, <laughs> completely 2D. Yes, you're just moving this is my avatar, you know. And um eventually the palace what I think is what I loved about it too very user friendly I thought. It was a very big deal for some people to download the client software. This was, remember, this was not like how we work. This was not like whatever this thing is. I can't remember the name of your beautiful Shimyard. software. Yes. You know, it's, it, it was not, it was not web-based at all. And I think that was a barrier for some people. But anyway, what I'm trying to get at is the palace wanted other people to create more palaces. And this started like they would sort of advertise that or they would talk about that. And I I started to think how great it would be to have a palace for Indigenous people. How we could, how there's so many of us. Now I was starting to meet other contemporary artists, you know, besides us, besides Ryan and like us who were in Montreal, they were actually, oh, they're all over Turtle Island, you know. And... Remember back then you had to pay for long distance calls, <laughs> you know, and it was expensive to talk to people on the phone, but this was free. Of course, you needed a computer, you needed a modem, you needed all this stuff, but it, you know, there was, I had access through Obero and I started to think about how other people could get access. And I started, so basically I started to, I'm, I'm really trying to compress this story because it really took a very long time, but basically figured out that I I should and wanted to and did create my own palace called Cyber Pow Wow with the help of Nation to Nation, with the help of other Indigenous artists. And we started to have these gatherings. We found other places in North America and well and beyond who had computers and modems. And we connected up and we invited people to come in as Nation to Nation always had. We had food and we made sure that people would sit down and I'd say, look, you just press the arrow key. Look, that's your avatar. Look, that's you. Put your name. Oh, look, now you're moving around. Say something. Oh, that's what you said. <laughs> and showed them how to use it, you know. But also the, uh, the cyber power space was a place for arts too. The, 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 mm -hmm. the people were creating uh, text and uh, images uh, to, so it was a cyber gallery in, in it a sense. It was. It was not even in a sense. Like today, that's like, yes, it was a gallery. And today people are talking about cyber powwow. They're recognizing it in a way they didn't when it came out as one of the first galleries. On, so it was definitely the first indigenous online gallery. And it was one of the first galleries, online galleries uh, at the time. So you were a pioneer uh, without uh, knowing it. Yes. <laughs> Is it this yes. website? 
-hmm. Yes, we kept, I kept the, thanks to different, like, yes, thanks to Abtech and my partner, Jason Lewis, we have kept the Nation to Nation and Cyber Power websites up all this time, even though you can't quite see everything. What happens when you click on gallery, Alexandre? Yeah, so you can see, you can visit some remnants of the artworks that were in there, but at least we have all the artists who participated here and it tells you if the work was a web-based work or a palace-based work. And yeah, there were four iterations. We, you know, we started off asking a question similar to what you just asked me earlier, Andre, like, you know, can indigenous art, can, and of course we were native then, you know, or First Nations, can First Nations artists be authentic if they make digital art? You know, uh, and the answer was, of course we can, you know, but well, it was a question. Yes, again, we have to go back in that time. I remember Virginia Pessi Matteo Bordolo uh, uh, told me that, uh, well, a friend uh, uh, of her who was a, a non native artist recognized, told her, you know, when I use feathers, I am still doing contemporary art but if you use aluminium as an aboriginal you are still doing uh, 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 traditional uh, uh, traditional non-contemporary art because you are aboriginal that's incredible but it was the 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 I would say the general speech at, at this yeah. Uh, period. Yeah, absolutely. And also another uh, uh, things that we were uh, that were expressed by the Aboriginal artists, and it was out of this uh, uncertainty. They were often tell telling and. It was also creating a kind of uh, inner distance between uh, Aboriginal artists because they were tell uh, many uh, uh, avant-garde artists were telling, well, I am an artist first and uh, I happen to be Aboriginal, but it's not that important. And I think uh, you never adhere to that, uh, to that speech. No, I mean, I, I think I mostly... I, there, I mean, I think I questioned all of it. I think over the over the years, I tried all kinds of different um, identities on. I don't want to, I mean, that's a weird, I got to be careful how I say that. I've always been Mohawk. I've never hidden that fact. I, I've always been proud to be Mohawk. But I have, I have wondered, you know, for example, when I was hired at, uh, at Hire, I was hired, but at the Banff Center, I was one of the first recipients of the then very new grant, which was called, um, I think it was called Indigenous Curators Grant or something. And like, you know, my, they made me a card and on, you know, we were trying to decide if the card should say Indigenous Curator or not. And I was like, well, it's so weird. Like actually the other curators don't have to put their you know, you know, white curator or Italian curator or something, you know, so maybe not, I said, you know, so, you know, so that was one time, you know, one time that I, I sort of took it away, but just, yeah, I just wanted to see if it made, it just didn't seem to make sense in the context of everything, you know, on my bio originally, I used to say my entire you know, I used to say, I am the daughter of a Mohawk woman and an Italian immigrant father a, a mohawk mother mother and an italian immigrant father like i felt like i i gave my genealogy for so long and then finally i was like you know other people don't have to do that i don't think i'm going to put that anymore you know and by that time though i had i was using my name skawanati because you know I, I you've known me andre since i was trisha fragnito you know so now i i'm using just skawanati and i have in my bio like so many things that indicate that I'm indigenous, like that I was a member of the Quebec Native Women's Association, that I, I don't know, I had this show or that show, you know, so I, I sort of, 
slowly uh, took out the kind of the some of the details. But anyway, so yeah, it's, I don't know. It's, 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 <laughs> it seems for me that in, in, in cities, it's important to show where you come from. But well, uh, no, can uh, who who your mothers are, uh, your your parents are. But for us, I think I was I would only say I come from Manuan. No need to say I'm a Tikamek from Manuan. I just say I come from Manuan. So so people will will uh, will know that I'm I'm probably a Tikamek. Yeah, I yeah. I mean I'm I've, what I've noticed now, right right now in the last couple of years, I have noticed people are saying. My mother was Brenda Deerhouse. Her parents were, this, like, I've noticed people really putting their genealogy into their bios, which is some, like, so I don't know, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, I, I, yeah, it's, I think we're trying things. We're, we're just experimenting with stuff and figuring out what works best for each of us individually, but also us as a collective, the collective of indigenous people, you know. Well, but uh, when you present yourself at the beginning, uh, you told us, I am from Ganavagi. And uh, I think this notion of uh, connection to a land or to a territory or to a community is important. And uh, then we can, uh, it makes it the, the links for the uh, author uh, uh, web uh, uh, initiative, uh, uh, which is, uh, wow, well, I have to remember, indigenous spaces uh, on uh, cyberspace. Can, can you speak about it? It was like the uh, continuation of cyber power. Um, so, oh, you mean Aboriginal territories in cyberspace? Yes, right. Yes, it very much was the continuation of cyber power in many ways. I mean, just the name itself, if you, you know, on the website, you might have noticed, like it said, cyber powwow, an Aboriginal territory in cyberspace. That's what we were trying to do. We were trying to start to stake a claim, kind of like a land claim, but in, in, in virtual territory. Uh, and so when when Jason Lewis and I started uh, had the first were able when we were first able to apply for a grant to do something, the grant was a pilot project from the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council called Aboriginal Research Networks. And we were like, well, we've created a network with Cyber Power. We have a big network. And so we decided to call the grant Aboriginal Territories in Cyberspace, ABTEC. And um, we we were very clear of what we wanted to do. We had, you know, we uh, we had lived together in San Francisco during the big tech bubble. We felt, you know, we felt like we were some of the we knew a lot of the people, a lot of the indigenous people who were kind of embracing this technology. You know, and we thought this is a really important moment for us as Indigenous people because it doesn't, I think, never before, well, I, I, I hesitate to say never, but with certain technologies, you know, Indigenous people did not, could not get their hands on them at the same time as white people. So we always talk about the fact that white men, you know, had cameras and took pictures of us and then told their stories about us. Now we were everybody was getting the, the web at the same time. We were there at the ground floor along with white people and other people. And we thought it was very important that we make sure that we, that our presence was there. Présence autochtone. <laughs> In cyberspace, you know. So we started doing, so we certainly started this network. We, you know, we, we gathered a bunch of people together. and. Uh, we talked about what were some of the things we could do together and how should we how should we do it and i remember very clearly oh i'm trying to think of her name now this wonderful storyteller from up north you know her too oh my goodness she's from the yukon beautiful woman with long dark hair all the time anyway her name will come to me in a moment but she she said we have to reach the youth and we have to reach them where they are and they're playing video games. You need to make some indigenous video games. And we were like, 
uh oh, <laughs> we don't we don't know how to do that. That's not quite what we were thinking, but we did it. We started to do it, and that's how we started the Skins program, Skins workshops in Aboriginal storytelling and experimental digital media. And that program is going on today. And we've been invited all over the place. It's been amazing. We've been invited to uh, Hawaii, to Regina, to Val d'Or. We're going up to uh, Nemeska in a couple of weeks. Uh, we're, we're going to New Zealand. We've been asked to do a machinima workshop. That's what I do. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's really been a, a wonderful program. When I see the the the, the short uh, uh, of uh, time traveler, I think it's a good example of uh, indigenous avatar uh, moving in uh, that uh, surreal uh, surroundings of the web, and maybe because I am old, but it take, took me back uh, in. Uh, in the 70s, where in uh, uh, there was this movement by, uh, by uh, the, uh, uh, the 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 black warriors, black is beautiful, and there was a lot of, of arts and posters to show the beauty of the the black persons uh, instead of the the uh, the look, right? opposing the look that comes from the outside. And uh, also, it was moving images, and we know how we have been caricatured uh, as uh, peoples in the cinema, especially American cinema. But uh, it is the one that have uh, spread uh, uh, spread this kind of images all over, all over the place and all over the world, and in our own minds too. So it was interesting to see that it was uh, image building too. Uh, exercise and also uh, I, I won't say an easy one but certainly easier than to do uh, 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 feature movies well yes I mean that's one of the reasons why I love machinima is it's it's pretty DIY do it yourself you know um, but there's a lot of reasons why I um I chose to, I mean, you're talking, I think you're talking about the fact that I'm making movies in virtual environments right now. So I should just explain the term because I don't think I did yet, but a machinima is a movie made in a virtual environment, like a video game. A lot of people know the machinima red versus blue, which is made in the halo video game, but a lot of people are making movies in Minecraft because it's such a customizable environment. I make my movies in second life which is also a customizable environment, which looks more realistic, if you will. I mean, it doesn't look like, um, hmm. I don't feel this is telling us very much, this picture. <laughs> I don't like the Wikipedia definition of machinima. Yeah. Why don't you, you could show them Time Traveler TM. Why don't you play one of the episodes while we talk? You don't have to play the sound. Uh, and uh, so, I had this story I wanted to tell. I have these skins workshops just beginning and we're trying to figure out what we can teach the, the youth, what, what the, is a curriculum that we can build. Certainly we can build a video game curriculum, you, you know, using a game engine and, and teaching them how to model their own characters. But maybe we want to show them how to tell stories in this slightly easier medium, like where the characters are already made for you. Like you just have to customize them. You can just change their eye color. You can, you know, you can give them new hair, give them costumes. So I, so when I saw Second Life, I was just, again, it was like the palace. First of all, it was like the palace on so many levels. You could talk to people. You had an avatar. Now it wasn't just a smiley face. It was a whole body. It moved in 3D, not just two, you know. Uh, and uh, did I already say it was customizable? I think I said it five times, but yeah, you know, you could like, you could do all this stuff. And so I had this story I had written 
for another project and I really wanted to find a way to tell the story. And it was about a man who lived in the future, who had a jetpack. And I was like, I don't, I can't do a live action version of this. I don't know how to do that. I, I am not a movie maker. I've never made films, you know, how, you know, I could, pro I could probably try, but I just, I knew it would take millions of dollars and like lots of people. But this, this, here you are, here you, you enter, you enter Second Life and your avatar already has the ability to walk, run and fly. All I had to do was put a jetpack on his back and press the F button and he was flying, you know? And so, and of course, I felt like Second Life was a very futuristic medium. Second Life was built, the, the, the mythology goes that this guy read a book called Snow Crash, which describes a place called the metaverse. And he said, I want to build that. And he made Second Life. And so to me, Second Life is so futuristic, you know, like already, like it's futuristic because of its pedigree or its, its, its heritage coming from this cyberpunk novel. It's futuristic because we're in an online space talking to people in real time, networked over the internet. You know, it's, it's futuristic because of how it looks, you know, like a video game. And so I thought what I wanted to do at this point, what I wanted strongly to do was illustrate, visualize Indigenous people in the future. By now, it was very clear to me that this was something I was uniquely positioned to do. You know, I wanted to make contemporary art. I loved science fiction. And I, I wondered a lot about why we weren't there in the future. And so... I just have, I just started this project and I sort of have never stopped that project. I keep doing different things that are like that. I, I, I joke, but it's not a joke. I, it's really not a joke at all. I say to people, you can say almost anything about native people and add in the future. And it hasn't been done yet. Like we have so much work to do regalia of the future, you know, powwow of the future. These are all kinds of things that we can start to think about and imagine who do we want to be in the future? What values do we want to take from our past and bring to the future? Wow, it's, uh, uh, and uh, I was wondering, uh, I understand that uh, you as artists has been recognized at the point, but uh, you had uh, there was uh, two challenges first you were not at all hiding your <laughs> identity <laughs> indigenous identity and second you were using uh popular uh, culture items uh video games uh, uh bingos uh, <laughs> <pow -wows>. uh <laughs> Everything that was not uh, very trendy in the galleries and, uh, and uh, how how the recognition came uh, finally. Uh, and you were also uh, doing things in collaboration. Uh, you were not uh, 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 there with uh, a specific signature of uh, on the material works. So uh, uh, you work on the complete uh, 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 outdoor path from the, the, the museums or the, the institutions of contemporary arts. Yeah, pretty much, I guess so. I, I, I mean, I've never been strategic. I'm trying to get more strategic as I get older, but I've never tried to, I never said, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do it a different way and, and still reach the place I didn't even have a goal, actually, a, a far goal. I didn't say I want to be in the National Gallery one day. I just wanted to make art. And um, I definitely love showing it to people. But that was happening through Nation to Nation, you know. And slowly, over time, you know, people were interested enough like that. And, well, the other thing that happens that you don't realize is going to happen 
is your peers start to have power too. So your peers become curators and gallery directors and all this. And they are like, oh, I know, I've known Scawinati for so long and she's been doing this kind of work. And I think it would be very interesting to put that in the gallery. So that starts to happen, you know, so like that, that's cool, you know, uh, and then, uh, well, I mean, honestly, so a couple of, you know, yeah, it's really that like in, you know, at Obero, I worked with someone named Sylvie Fortin and she became the artistic director of the Montreal Biennale. And I think she suggested my name to the curators. I was, ex Time Traveler TM was shown in that big show. And to me, that was really like my first big level up. I mean, I'd been showing an artist one centers a lot, like a good amount. Well, it's an okay amount, I, I, you know, but that was like, then I started to get invitations from a lot of different places to show that work. And then, you know, slowly to make new work. Um, and then in, in really, I feel during COVID, something happened where with Black Lives Matter, I think that translated here as, here in Canada, I mean, as people really wanted to collect non-white artists. So like definitely Black artists, but also Indigenous artists. And because of COVID, people were suddenly interested in digital art, more interested because there, there was all these online galleries and all this, everything was online. And so I was in this amazing moment uh, with this, my Venn diagram was like, you know, indigenous artist and digital artist. And so I, I think that was very, I got a lot of requests and invitations at that time too. Yes, uh, and I saw somewhere in uh, your bio that uh, even the uh, uh, Museum of Contemporary Arts of Montreal uh, had uh, some of your work. But this is very recent because I remember it's not maybe maybe 10 years ago, but, uh, maybe uh, I don't remember exactly, but this exhibition uh, coming from Vancouver Red Nation, they were coming and uh, it was uh, a collective exhibition that was uh, uh, that the new direction because uh, the, the older one wouldn't have take that risk, but the, uh, there was a new uh, direction at the museum and the they took the, 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 the this exhibition to display in Montreal, but it one of the condition of uh, uh, getting the expo shown in another city than Vancouver was to uh, have works with local indigenous artists to uh, uh, to be part of the uh, uh, of the show, and they say well. We will look in our reserve and uh, we will uh, show some uh, Quebec Aboriginal artists. Uh, it's okay. And they sang and everything was going uh, well. But when they look in the reserves, they find zero work from an Aboriginal artist. And then it was a good lesson for them because they say, well, we have now to uh, make some acquisition, acquisition because uh, already there was uh, a national and international recognition of uh, se several of our uh, uh, artists uh, that were now famous and there was nothing in Montreal at the museum. That's uh, that's. That means a big step forward uh, when, uh, uh, and I don't know if you sh share this. Uh, I always remember Rebecca Belmore when uh, at the inauguration of uh, the, is show facing the monumental. And I think she was the first one at the, the uh, museum in Montreal to have a solo exhibition uh, at the, uh, Contemporary Arts Museum, and I told her, uh, Rebecca, that's fantastic. Look at that, you. We are we are now in the uh, uh, the, the the big place. <laughs> it uh, that was closed. That was that seemed uh, uh, 
a, a fortress that so far away and now you are there with uh, a, a solo exhibition it's really a great great uh, step forward and uh, <coughs> needs an opening from the uh, arts institution she told me yes andre but for how long <laughs> <laughs> yeah so I you that, is that it can stop at the moment it, for me it's uh, it's a big concern when i see the the the, the women's right in the, uh, in the united states that are just falling apart and i said wow something we we had believed one forever and so uh, uh since rebecca told me that it's always somewhere behind my my head and it pop up at, uh, often and i said wow we are living in a good period but will, will it last yep that's i asked that too we've been the flavor of the week a few times right after 1990 there was the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples that came out in 92. And that was like, everyone was, it seemed like everyone was thinking about Indigenous people, but not really everybody was. But anyway, there was a lot of work done at that time. And that was very good work, I think. Then the Truth and Reconciliation TRC Committee, Commission, Commission came out. And um, that was what, 2018? No, 2016? No. 2016. 2016, yeah, you know, and I felt like I felt like it repeated a lot of the stuff from the RCAP, but I felt like a lot more people heard it. I really do. I feel like you know, I think I do feel that the younger generations are really tuned in to indigenous issues, and I I like that a lot. But yeah, who knows? Who knows what's gonna happen? You know. Uh, I, I've definitely felt that way a lot. Like I've, I, I've said the same thing as Rebecca, like, oh, how long is this going to last, you know? But at the same time, I'm trying to get away from having a scarcity mentality, you know, trying to think like it's, you know, it's, it's going to come, it's going to continue. I'd rather feel that way, you know, always safe for a rainy day, but definitely just like, just work without too much worry, you know? Anything can end at any moment, anything. Your life can end, your job can end, you know, like, so it's just like, just enjoy the moment, save a little bit or like prepare in some ways, but there's no point in worrying. <laughs> and also uh, the future is ours to build too. Uh, so yes. we have to keep on working and fighting. Yes. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. So yeah. correction. Uh, uh... Uh, Truth and uh, Reconciliation uh, was dissolved in 2016, uh, 15. From 2000, uh, 2008 to 2015. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, also you have been, uh, uh, you, uh, we know that uh, you have no boundaries <laughs> around you and uh, you never made the boundaries between your uh, engagement your uh, uh, I would say being a militant as a uh, indigenous woman and the uh, your uh, art uh, your involvement in arts well thank you I like being called a militant <laughs> it's not in my bio yeah I mean um yeah, I, I think it's important to, I, I mean, Andre, we've known each other for so long. You know, I think we've been doing such similar work for so long. We've been on committees together. We've shown up at events together. You know, we've both been at events, same events for so long in the city. I'm not even sure what I'm, what I'm, what I'm trying to tell you, say. It's just like, yeah, there's a lot of, there's a lot of work to be done. And uh, I'm I'm happy to I'm getting tired I'm a little bit tired but I'm also I'm also still very motivated you know and uh, I think I was more of an activist in a way like more of a tr what we traditionally think of as an activist like when I was younger like I was doing I was a nuclear disarmament activist I I don't know if you know that but like you know I would 
talk and talk and talk to people. I organized marches. I, I did like this kind of activism, you know, um, but I got, I found it very tiring and it, it's, it is very tiring. And uh, slowly I started to think of my art as slow motion activism, you know, that it's hopefully going to change some people's minds or open their minds. You know, um, I try not to get too, I try to not I don't want to force people to do anything, you know, but I think that putting some images and ideas out there can help people maybe move forward in a direction that I think is good, you know, and that that is like to a more just world, a more even playing field where all of us can be who we want to be safely and, you know, reach our self-actualization, you know, yeah. Yes, and this, I, I should say that this kind of uh, optimism, but uh, active optimist, uh, is, uh, uh, we can see it through, through your work, right? It's not uh, many, uh, uh, well, it's normal, uh, many artists have uh, a dark look at the reality, but uh, your works are uh, colorful, are funny, are, uh, we are uh, happy. Uh, uh, when we uh, we finish the video, so that that's uh, a good. It, actually, it helps us to uh, going uh, on on what we have to do uh, to to have a better future. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Miawa. Yeah. Uh, also, you told me you came back. Uh, you just came back from uh, San Francisco. So this is uh, brand new. Can you speak about it? Yes, uh, I'm like dying to talk. I'm like so thrilled about this project. It's called They Sustain Us. And it is the story of how the three sisters, our beloved personifications of corn, beans, and squash, as we know, became superheroes. And I started to have this idea actually around like a long time ago, like maybe 2018 or possibly earlier of like, of depicting them as superheroes. And it's like, wow, no one has done this before. Like, this is really obvious. This has, somebody has to do it. And I, I want to be that person. Uh, and so I started, uh, I was invited by gray area. Um, uh, they call themselves an art and culture incubator. No, an art and tech Oops, sorry, but anyway, they, they do a bunch of things, but they're very tech oriented. Uh, they're based in San Francisco and they offered me a commission to make a new work, a new multimedia immersive performative. That was the main word, performative work. And when they first asked me, I said, I don't do performance. And, and Wade Wallerstein, the curator, he said, I said performative <laughs> and avatars perform. And I was like, all right, I know exactly what I want to do, or almost exactly. I knew I wanted to tell this particular story, as I said, but the form, I thought I was going to do one of my usual machinimas. I thought I was going to have each of them tell their story, talking, you know, walking around the garden or something. And I wrote out this, I did my research. I consulted with my amazing cousin, Stephen McCumber, who has been growing a Three Sisters garden for decades. You know, I read some books. I did, you know, looked on the internet, did some research, thought about it a lot. And I write my story. And I write out the storyboard. And I go, this is going to be really boring. They're just standing there talking. <laughs> uh, I also had, when I proposed this project, I, I, I really wanted to have the three avatars appear in front of the audience as in, in the flesh. So I, I put in there some, as part of the project, there would be three actresses or actors who would wear these superhero costumes and come out and interact in some way with the audience. Um, and so when I came to this slight crisis that my machinima wasn't going to be very good, I had, to, you know, I started, I had to, I felt like re, I wanted to rethink it and I did. And I thought, Scamanati, you know, what do you want to make? What would excite you to make? And I, I just immediately, I, I've been wanting to make a music video in Machinima, and I've been wanting to do a runway show of the three sisters' costumes. 
Because in the story, as they tell their story, they're moving through time. And they have different outfits that kind of reflect that time. Uh, and so what I ended up doing was turning the story, taking my script and cr crossing out all the extraneous stuff and making it rhyme. And it became a rap song. And so I filmed it as a music video with them as not only, sup not only superheroes, but also rap stars. And, uh, and then at the end, instead of just three actors, there are 12 beautiful models who come out wearing each of the outfits and show and, sh you know, and have that sort of part of, uh, of the cyber or the imagined becoming real. That's like my new thing of like, how can we make this future more present? You know, my older stories, like you saw Time Traveler TM or The Peacemaker Returns, they take place in, an, in centuries. And so when I talk about the eras represented in this story, I say free contact, colonization, genetic modification, and five minutes in the future. Very soon. Very soon we will have this. <laughs> and speaking of the future, you have mentioned skins and your work with the uh, 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 younger uh, generation of uh, Aboriginal artists. And uh, I would like to... to to have more details because I know how it is important for you and how it is important for Jesus. And I was meeting you and you were t always telling me, well, the young people has to get the tools and yet it is important and video game is important. And it was really so uh, uh, something you wanted to work on. And now it seems to, uh, to work very well. So. I would like you to, uh, to tell us more about this uh, fantastic story. Oh, there's so much to say. First of all, I want to say that youth are the true future. Like, that's just clear. Uh, we have a website. People should go take a look at that. Uh, it's, uh, I believe, I actually cannot remember the URL, but Alexandra, you've been so amazing at finding stuff. It's, it's definitely available through the Abtech website that you were on earlier. Um, we, offer th we offer a number of workshops. Um, it's like we're nonprofit, eh? We're, it's, out of, it's part of Concordia's, like we're underneath Concordia's big umbrella. Um, but, and also because we've developed these through the university, these curricula through the university, they are free and available to the public. Like if, if some teacher wanted to take our curriculum and use it in the class, that's absolutely no problem. Um, but we have a lot of expertise in teaching Indigenous youth now. Uh, and so we, when invited, we do go. Uh, we, you know, they have, yeah. So the three, we have three main categories, I guess you can say. The first one is the seventh gen character design workshops. Uh, all of our workshops can like shrink or grow according to the amount of time the people, the host has. Like sometimes, you know, Dawson down the street, they want a two hour workshop. So this um, seventh gen character design workshop is like very easy. Pen like we can do that in two hours. We just use pencil and paper and we guide them through creating um, a character that that lives in seven generations from now. Um, but sometimes they, someone from Nemeska wants us to come up for the whole week. And so we can still do that project, that, that workshop, but we expand it so that they can, we can bring it into second life and they can first, they first draw the car, the character, but then in second life, they, they modify an avatar to look like that character. And sometimes we end up taking a portrait. Sometimes we go all the way into doing a machinima, depending on the amount of time we have and, uh, and what they would like to do. The video game workshops, uh, we have new video games. We, you know, Bitsy and Twine are, are 2D and text-based um, workshops that, uh, uh, sorry, sorry, they're 2D and text-based um, software, I guess, uh, that they, that we can also do sort of shorter mission, uh, shorter, sorry, I'm getting my words mixed up here. We can do shorter workshops with those, but we can do, use Unity to create, you know, and Blender and all these other software to create a real 
what I'm saying real, but you know, what people, a, a 3D interactive video game that people imagine when you say video games. And then machinima workshops, we can teach people what I do. And soon we will have an AI workshop that we're working towards. I think um, I need that workshop. Yeah. Uh, because uh, I'm starting to use uh, ChatGPT. Yes. For for text for doing texts, and then I send uh, to my colleague Andre to to uh, to make the corrections. Well, I change everything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, that's you know. Yeah. I mean, one of the tricky things is um, is uh, we don't recruit. It's not tricky. I just mean we don't do the recruiting. We like to work with an organization that either you know already has students, like the Ganawage Education Center, for example, you know, or uh, is willing to recruit. So sometimes galleries have invited us, and like, yeah, because we don't know, you know, and we don't, you know, Regina, the Mackenzie Gallery, like, we don't know that population so we're not going to recruit and we don't have the resources to do that so we're spending our resources on developing the curriculum and and finding instructors and making sure we know the programs very well so we can teach it but uh alexandre you can start a, a group in uh, manuam and invite uh, skawenati uh, to give the workshop or, yeah, or sure. the workshops yeah. <laughs> you can do that or you know i mean there's like uh there's andre i'm forgetting the name but you know what i mean when i say the native friendship center there's two oui, the other one. Centre yeah you know those 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 are i mean anyway that's possible like you know there's yeah it's true if there's a group of people if you have a group mm -hmm. of just even five people that could be we could make we could work something out I'm pretty sure that I uh, know some people that would be um, interested for that. Yes, we have uh, to uh, spread the word and expand uh, the, these uh, fantastic facilities to uh, many uh, Aboriginal uh, would-be artists uh, that uh, will uh, take us not five minutes, but uh, forever in the future. <laughs> I think that's uh, that's it for today. Do you have something you would like to add, uh, Scavenetti? Oh, no. Just thank you for the wonderful conversation. It's a pleasure chatting with you. Oh, I guess, uh, you know, a little plug for Daphne. <laughs> I don't know. You have to have a podcast with, with me or someone else from our, our crew, but uh, very happy to be a co-founder of the Montreal's first Indigenous Artist Run Center, Daphne. Yes, and they are our neighbor. We are on, uh, in the, the same uh, uh, neighborhood. Uh, just uh, they, they are just the street beside us. So, yeah. <laughs> so uh, uh, and, uh, there is a lot of activities in uh, Daphne with uh, Aboriginal artists. And uh, this is uh, a place uh, to, uh, to visit. And... Uh, you may uh, even uh, encounter Alexandre or me on the street. <laughs> so awesome. Thank you very, very much, Kamenati. It was a, a wonderful moment to uh, uh, go through uh, the, this uh, incredible experience you had uh, as a, a human being, an artist, uh, a Mohawk woman. Uh, all, all of this blend together uh, to uh, create uh, all this uh, uh, fantastic works that uh, certainly uh, make us uh, uh, our pace to the future more happy. Yeah, we'll go, Andre. Miigwetsu, Skawenati, thank you. And uh, just to uh, tell our uh, listeners with uh, on the audio part who, who, can see, who can't see us, I uh, have uh, posted the, on the links, all the links of uh, what you talk about during the, the, the podcast. You can see the link or um, the links to our uh, a comment section of Facebook page. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Alexandre. It was nice to meet you. Yeah, me yeah. too. 
And uh, everybody, we have uh, our meeting on uh, at the Degan Street uh, each Wednesday at noon. So uh, see you next week. Yeah, see you next week. Matashi. Matashi. Bye.